I see songs as colors, as paintings, you know, and I see gear as paintings. If I have three compressors, that to me, they're just three different shades of red and three cues are just different shades of blue. And so I try to paint that picture when I'm mixing and I never start with the same paint I used from the last portrait. I always get fresh paint. I always start from scratch. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Hello, rock stars. It's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars. I created this show to introduce you to real world recording professionals, to hear their stories and learn from their experiences so that you can take your records to the next level and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is James Waddell, a Grammy-winning producer, engineer, writer, and mixer. He is the owner of Lyric Canvas, a studio in Nashville, Tennessee, offering music production and mixing to clients from all over. Some of the artists that James has worked with are Santana, Aretha Franklin, Johnny Lang, CeCe Winans, Robert Randolph, Jill Scott, Ariana Grande, Indy Ari, and Mary Jade Blige, to name a few. And James's music has appeared on shows like Jimmy Kimmel Live, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Die Hard 2, Frasier, and Dr. Phil. Some of the things that I know about James is he's an expert on Native Instrument Machine and Pro Tools from Avid. He records his drums with mostly Shure SM57s and rides to the studio on a badass Harley Davidson motorcycle. Please welcome James Waddell to Recording Studio Rockstars. James, are you ready to rock, man? I'm ready, Lidge. I knew you were ready. <laughs> ready as I can be. Right on, dude. Well, <clears throat> that's my introduction of you. Can you tell us more about yourself in your own words and you know how you got into all this? The condensed version. You know, I grew up in church. In the South, you know, my grandmother was the organ player. My grandfather played in the choir. So I was around music my whole life. Um, my dad was a singer for probably 10 years of my life doing nightclubs in, in Atlanta and South Carolina. And uh, so I've always been around music, you know, but it wasn't actually until I was 20, in my mid-20s, that I, uh, I had already graduated college, had a job, was doing great. And then in my mid-20s, I... Uh, quit everything and packed up, moved here to Nashville to pursue a career in music, you know, kind of see if it, it worked out. And, uh, so a couple of years ago, <laughs> just a few. <laughs> and so, yeah, so I moved here back in 94 and, um, to give it a shot and, and I'm still here so far. <laughs> nice, man. Did you learn how to play organ yourself? Or you keyboards first well, my grandmother in her house you know she had a, a full music room so there was an organ there was a piano there and so i used to yeah sit around and bang on them all the time <laughs> nice and your dad was a singer huh so what about you do you did you get into singing much no i never got into singing because you know it was we, we grew up in a really small town and uh i think what what got me to not sing was uh when i was in second grade we had choir tryouts. Now, I would have never thought that a second grader would have to try out for a choir because <laughs> I figure all second graders can't sing. But <laughs> but we had choir tryouts, and uh, and I didn't make choir because I wasn't as good as my dad was um, when he was growing up. You know, everybody kind of, you know, oh, I remember your dad, da 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 I don't think I ever sang another day in my life except for in the shower, of course. Nice, man. <laughs> Well, let's see. What about getting into recording? I mean, you know, I know you've become quite an expert at, with Pro Tools. In fact, I think you were telling me that you spent time working directly with Avid and Pro Tools. You know, I was uh, a teenager still living in, in South Carolina and uh, knew really nothing about recording as far as consoles and tape machines. But I did get my first computer and I got into MIDI and I got into synthesizers. Commodore 64? Atari. Atari, nice. 1040 man. ST. Uh, floppy drive. That's getting badass right there. Yeah, so I, I that's kind of what was my start. My start was with MIDI because that seemed to be a cheaper route, and I didn't need to record anything because I didn't sing. And so I get, really got into MIDI, got heavy into MIDI, and I guess that would be what really piqued my interest. You know, as a teenager, 
you know, having a computer, you know, having a synthesizer and being able to create all these crazy sounds, you know. Let's talk a little bit about that too. I mean, MIDI from when you started to what it is now has changed quite a bit. It's almost, there's almost no more MIDI inside MIDI even, you know. It's, yeah, it confuses like, me now. <laughs> <laughs> Do you miss anything about the way that MIDI used to be done and when you were composing that way versus what's what happens now with uh, composing with virtual instruments and all that? I think for me, I'm a hands-on kind of guy. So I, I, it made sense to me when I connected multiple devices and I knew that I had a 0 0.06 millisecond delay between each MIDI note because it was run serially, you know, all of these things. And I think the part that gets me now is, is everything being more virtual. So I have to imagine that inside of my computer. And I think that sometimes will get stifling when a company will come out kind of with new terminology, you know, that that means the same thing as something else, but you're not sure, but it kind of means it, but it doesn't quite do what that did. And you're like, but so what is it for? And there's really a lot of times in documentation, there's not explanation of, of what that is. Right. You just you know? get the fancy new terminology. You just get a new terminology make and your you got to figure great. out exactly what that terminology does. It's close to doing what something else used to do, but yet it does a few things differently. So you're like, okay, how does this work? So you have to do the routing in your head rather than look at the routing physically. Yeah, know? I find that's difficult too. I mean, I, I don't want to go on a tangent here, but when I work on my laptop, for example, I'll have to have 20 browser tabs open now or something like that to do the stuff I'm taking care of. And I realize that I'm taking up a, like a big portion of my brain power to keep this 3D structure of what's going on inside the computer in my imagination, which is exactly what you just said, you know? Yes. Whereas, you know, it used to be in the studio, you just turn to your right and there's the keyboard and you turn to your left and there's the drum machine. And there's an output and there's an input and, you know. Let's see. One of the things too, I would imagine is that when you were hooking up those other physical pieces of gear and you knew that it, what was it? You said 0.6 milliseconds or 6 milliseconds? Oh, 0 0.06 milliseconds. Wow. That's not a lot even. But, it, but that's per event. So if you play a simple major triad, you know, a chord in your right hand and a octave bass note in your left hand, you're essentially hitting five MIDI events on that keyboard. So therefore, there's a 0 0.06 millisecond delay between each one of those oh, events, man. which will continue to add up. And wow. so back then, you know, if we if we layered, say, one device to another device, that it just continually exponentially grew that 0 0.06, which is what we know as latency now. Right, right. Well, so now one of the frustrations I find sometimes with the newer stuff is it acts as if everything's just magically done inside the box for you. But sometimes, you know, do you find that sometimes there are those imperfections that you're that aren't being reported to you and you have to kind of learn them and pick up on them and like, you know, not a, all the notes aren't hitting exactly together or, or is it, is it, can we mostly just trust that everything's working in the computer? No, you can't trust that everything's working all the time. And I think probably the difficulty now is that I feel like we have, there are so many parameters involved in, in those issues that we have now that any one thing can not only cause that issue, but can cause it by varying degrees. Whereas it was a given before, it's 0 0.06 per blah, 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 blah. But now it's if I pull up this plug in, it's this much. If I pull up this plug in, it's this much, you know. Or so if I'm, you just, if you open the session today, it might be right on and you open it tomorrow and it might be a little bit And off. it might be a little different because the plugins loaded up on chips in a different order. And so therefore there's some inherent thing that says, okay, I'm going to be 12 samples off instead of two samples off or three. You know, I, I don't think it's a... Uh, Perfect. At so, this how do you point. deal with that, though? I mean, do you learn every single variation and try and always stay a hundred percent on top of it, or is there a part of you that has learned to just just kind of go with the flow and and you know use your if it feels good, it is good kind of thing? Well, I would say that's definitely my approach to mixing. Is is I approach from a a much more of a feel and much more of a musical standpoint. Um, I've I feel like because I'm not a very tech, I don't feel like I'm a very technical guy. You know, I know guys like Reed Shippen that like is an unbelievably, he's musical, but he's unbelievably technical and great at that. You know, I'm not, I'm not the technical guy, you know, I'm, I'm definitely more of a 
strictly music and feel and you know you ride a harley i do ride not, a harley. not a rice burner right no it's a harley <laughs> So, all right. Well, cool, man. Well, how about uh, starting us off here? Uh, we've kind of jumped in, but how about starting us off with an inspirational quote, something to get us kind of psyched up about recording? You got anything good for us to get us get us motivated? Man, an inspirational quote. I would say just stick with it, you know? I mean, it's it's not about making a gazillion dollars. It's not about winning awards, you know? For I think that for for some guys that do music, some of them do it because they do want that fame and that thing. But then there are other guys that just do it because you can't not do it. It, you know, it's kind of in your soul. You know, if yeah. I was working at McDonald's or a bank or whatever, if I was doing anything else, music would be a part of my life every day in some way because I feel like I wouldn't survive without it. Yeah. You know, and if that's what you feel on the inside, then do it at whatever level you're doing it because that's what's going to give you the satisfaction just knowing that you're doing it, you know? That's so true. I think I just realized that when I was 23 and I was backpacking around Europe and I had this chance to go, my brother had, I've got to make a long story short, but my brother had invited me to fly from London where I was living and working and join him in Hong Kong to play in a blues band. I Within a week I was there, you know? And I left an apartment and two jobs and a girlfriend, a great girlfriend too, because it was something in me that was like, I can't do this. Like I got to, I got to go do music. I got to go play in a band. I got to, I got to go to Hong Kong and play <laughs> in a shitty blues band with my brother. Right. And it had nothing to do with money or success or fame. It was just like, okay, there's something, you know, this force field that's pulling you in yeah. that won't let you get away from it. You know, if it's, if it's in you like that, you know? Yeah. So true. So true. Well, that's a great, great one, man. I like that. All right. Now, how about um, sharing with us an important, like a story about an important failure for you, something you've been doing this for a long time. You've had a lot of, made a lot of great records and uh, it's kind of nice to humanize it and bring it down to earth and remind us that, you know, we share a lot of the same struggles and frustrations any great stories about where shit really fell apart for you, but was a great learning experience? <laughs> There's plenty of those. I've got two ex-wives. <laughs> I, know, um, I know that story myself, too. I think all failures are important, you know, as long as you learn and grow from it, you know, and don't continue to repeat it. I think my problem is, is I probably have repeated a few a couple of times. What Off the top of your head, what are some things that you find, maybe even today, you're like, you're like, I got to remember to not do that thing when I'm making records because it, it kicks you in the butt. You know what I think it is? One one thing, I guess probably my biggest failure, which I, which I did one time in my career and have fortunately not done it again, is uh, having a, a backup would be, you know, since we moved into the digital age, I had a hard drive. It was my only hard drive and it had everything on it. You know, and I had just finished scoring a movie for someone, a little independent film. Fortunately, I had turned it all in, but that drive crashed on me. And I still, to this day, have the drive sitting sitting on the shelf in the other room. Like a reminder to Just yourself? to remind me, always, always have a backup. Now, I don't always have a backup in another location, in a fire safe, but I always have two of everything, Yeah, you know? From my system drive that I clone to my sample drives to my audio drives, I always have a duplicate somewhere. I might not be able to find it. <laughs> <laughs> it may take a while. But but that was probably one of the biggest, obviously a big lesson because I've held on to the drive for so many years, you know, as a reminder that, you know, they're mechanical. They have moving parts. They're going to fail. You know, you better have a backup. Yep. Yep. I had that happen to me again this year. I lost, I lost a system hard drive and it took me a week to reinstall everything on the studio computer and get back up running again. Mm. And there were some things on there I probably lost for good as well, but at least I had the wherewithal to make sure that my audio, my projects were always backed up and duplicated. And then same thing when I have archive hard drives and pull a project off the studio computer, there's always two, you know, any good tips for the system for doing that? I know if you're saying you can't always find that backup, do you have a, do you sort of have a drive and then you, you 
put it onto the drive, but then do you have some tool that you use for duplicating that or having the backup or do you just kind of drag and drop it over to the other drive? Okay. What so, works best? So on my, my sample drives and my system drives on my various computers, I clone those and I clone them maybe once a month so that at any point, if I do an update to a new version of, of Pro Tools or a new version of you know, some plugin or some native instruments thing that I'm doing. And all of a sudden my system's acting janky. I can always just kind of revert back. So I don't have anything on my system, but software that I run, you know, I don't have any really documents or anything. So I can just, once I replace that, I'm still kind of back to where I was minus whatever updates I did. Time machine for that or a carbon copy? A carbon cloner copy cloner like is what I'm using for that. The rest of my backup stuff, I just do drag and drop from drive to drive. Now, one thing that I do use, and I don't even know if you can get it anymore, but there was this app back in the handful of years back called CD Finder. I remember that one. It was great. And CD Finder, you know, we used to back up to CDs. Yeah. And you can't put so much information. So I would have, you know, if I backed up a project, it would be one of 30 CDs. And I could drag all of my CDs onto this little app And it would basically catalog everything on that CD. So that's what I'd still use that program. It still works great. And I just take any, all of my hard drives and drag them on top of this app. Does CD Finder, it's an older app. uh, Does it still run on the newer OS? It still runs in 10.8.5, which I think is what I've, the machine I have it on is, is system software. But, but yeah, so I drag all my drives on the CD Finder and therefore at any point, if I want to search for a file or someone calls and says, do you still have, I can type in in CD Finder and it'll tell me if I have it and which drive it's on and, you know, those sorts of things. So that's, it's been handy. Nice. Yeah. I used to use CD Finder and I would do it. I would, like you said, I would drag the hard drives and drop them on there so that later I could go flip through there and figure out which hard drive it was on. I haven't used that in a while and and the hard drives are starting to get unruly again, you know? <laughs> It's, uh, I think that what people don't realize and they forget, especially when, if you're kind of newly collecting your, your library of whatever, is that you're still in your head. You can keep track. Well, I've only got two drives. It's, you know, how hard is that? 10 years down the road, you've got uh, a lot more than two drives and those are old drives. Don't even, you don't even know how to connect them anymore or hook them up or, you know, they don't, those files you can't find. So. Yes. Keep up with it. All right. So now how about a moment of success for you? I mean, I know you've uh, won a couple of Grammys, which is pretty awesome. But if you got any stories about where everything just came together beautifully and it was a real uh, highlight for you, that'd be great to hear. Well, number one, the just the fact that I get to do music every day is success for me. You know, I mean, it, it really is as, as cheesy as it may sound. When I get up every morning and I know that I'm coming here, if I'm, I don't care if I'm editing tracks, I'm doing music and I'm, I feel I'm successful and thrilled to do that, you know? But if I had to pick a moment to say, you know, I felt like successful, it would be a, a probably a, a producer who I had admired for years, who's also a, you know, a songwriter, a bass player. And, you know, he, uh, he wrote, um, Changed the world for Eric Clapton, and uh, and then has produced Philadelphia for Springsteen, and wrote No Diggity for Black Street. You know, um, this guy Tommy Sims, who in his own right has an amazing record that he did back in I think about two thousand somewhere in there. I had just from the time I moved to town, had heard about this cat, tried to go to his shows, you know, and just like was nervous about ever talking to him because I just, I just loved his work, you know, loved everything he recorded, everything he played. And, uh, but guess 2000, sheesh, I'm guessing eight, seven, somewhere in there, six, the stars aligned. I got to meet him. And at that point was, I, and I had met him previous times through the years, you know, he's the nicest guy. Cause he would always act like he knew me and we were buddies, you know, or, you know, that we were friends that he had remembered me and, and maybe he did, but if he didn't, he sure made me feel like he did, you know, just a genuine, nice guy. And I would never, you know, he would always even comment. Yeah, man, let's get together. You know, he gave me his number. I never called the number. You know, I'm like, I'm not good enough to meet this guy yet. So I just would sit and work every day, work every day. And until I finally met him one day and 
and it just was like, okay, this is this is my shot to to play this guy what I do and see if there's a space for us to work together, you know, in the universe. So I played him some tracks. He seemed to dig them. And then a couple of days later, he called. He came over. We sat down like peers, you know. This guy I'm looking up to is like sitting here like my buddy and he's playing me his stuff and I'm playing him my stuff. And the next thing I know, I'm, you know, I'm one of his guys that's, you know, working with him on projects. And that to me was probably one of the the highlight moments for me. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, definitely I find that making records is about the people that we get to work with. And when you do get to work with somebody that is just awesome, it's sort of, it's hard to beat that. But it's also funny that, you know, the, the person that you're probably most likely to have a great, comfortable conversation with, you could be so nervous about approaching them the oh, first time around. Like I was that, so you know? nervous for so long, you know? And I'm sure once you guys start working together, it's just like you each know what each other's talking about all the time. Yeah. I mean, he was just, you know, everything about him, you know, he was just this cool cat, full of swag and an incredible and an, almost an intimidating musician because he he plays everything. He produces, he writes, he he does engineer, you know, he does. He's kind of like the Michael Jackson of the background of the music industry. You know, Michael, you know. Singers admire him. Dancers admired him. You know, musicians admired him because he was good at all of those things. And it's yeah. kind of the same way with Tommy, I feel like. You know, producers, writers, bass players, engineers all admire him because he's so great at all of those things, you know? That's cool, man. That's cool. Tell us now uh, some of the stuff that you're excited about right now. Man, I'm excited about everything right now. <laughs> all right. Well, we can we can start geeking out on some stuff because I, I definitely want to start digging into to some of the tech too. I know that you're hot shot on Native Instruments Machine and Pro Tools. Tell us tell us about both of those, but let's let's talk about Machine a little bit. I, I've messed around with it some and uh, it still scares the crap out of me a little bit, but I'd love to hear you talking about it and why it's badass and maybe how does does it help bridge that difference between the way it used to be with all the hands-on tools and the way it is now? Well, let me start by saying Avid nor Native Instruments is paying me a cent and you guys <laughs> should contact me because you should be paying me because I am, I, I think one thing I am is when I find something I like, I'm a true evangelist. And yeah. I would say both of those products would be something that I say are, are amazing. You know, Pro Tools is great. People can say, well, I like Logic. Well, I like Live. You know, that's fine. They all do the same thing, but Pro Tools has been my world, and I love those guys. I love what they do. You know, it's it's easy to use. They're slowly, you know, they're working and growing just like everybody else, you know. And and there's a place for live. There's a place for for Logic. All those guys are great. Pro Tools is just where I've lived. I find Pro Tools is very capable. Like, I've learned how to pick up a piece of sound from over here and put it perfectly in this spot over here. You know, it's gr wonderful for editing, and it's it's very uh editing and and as a mixing tool you know there there are always going to be features that we want there's always going to be features that logic doesn't have that we want or live doesn't have that we want you know and and everybody will slowly get there you know but but pro tools has been my world and and i think it's a great great program to use you know even though sometimes we call it slow tools <laughs> or pro fools <laughs> um and then native instruments man uh that's changed my life as well i I think I jumped on that bandwagon uh, with complete because, you know, being a keyboard player, you know, you're always looking for more sounds. So I moved into it there and the machine came out and I think I bought one of the first Mark 1s and tinkered with it on uh, on the old 1.x software. And and that was great. And then when they bumped up to 2.2.x, 2. 2. you know, it just kind of like really added life to it. Um, you know, as with everything, I still have sync issues occasionally. But the thing about Native Instruments Machine is that you can use it in so many ways. There's not one way to use it. You know, it's it's like an MPC, you know, and, and people will say, oh, well, it doesn't swing like an MP or it doesn't swing. You know, I think it will swing like an MP. You just have to find 50% uh, swing on an MP is not necessarily a 50% swing on any other device. You know, it might be 44, it might be 64, it might, you know, I think that you can find the same swing. It's just not the same numbers, mm -hmm. but, but just the ability to 
when I'm editing, when I'm not even when I'm creating, but when I'm replacing sounds, you know, I use machine. Um, if I need to add loops, I use machine because I can pull it up at, at, at not only as a standalone, but I can pull it up as a plugin in Pro Tools, create whatever beat I want, and I can drag and drop it as a loop. I can drag and drop it as individual sounds. I can drag and drop it as MIDI data all in an instant. I just have to decide which one of those ways I happen to want to work on this session. Yeah. And it's just, you know, it's just click and drag. Okay, here's the kick or click and drag. Here's the loop or click and drag. Here's the MIDI. Well, that's cool, man. Well, so now for for people who may not know anything about machine yet, give them a, give them a little bit of a breakdown of what we're talking about. What is it? Essentially, I guess machine... I mean, the actual hardware device is nothing more than a MIDI controller, you know, with pads, with knobs, you know. The software side of it would be comparable to what a DAW does without maybe the audio side of of recording tracks Mm because you don't record tracks as audio, you know. But as far as recording MIDI, as far as recording drums, as far as sampling and having samples... Um, but yet you can still use plugins and things within that. So when you pull inside up, the box, really in, inside of machine software. Oh, wow. cool. So all of my uh, UAD plugs, which you guys should call me too because I love your stuff. All of my UAD plugs that I use to mix in Pro Tools also will pull up as individual plugs in machine on tracks. So I can kind of process my loops or whatever with all my tools. You know, so I may have a UAD pull tech plugin on a kick drum inside of a machine plugin, which is inside of which Pro is Tools. inside of Pro Tools, and then still have that same EQ running on my vocal track at the same time. Um, and then the other thing, it's it's been my VST bridge. You know, we can't use VST instruments in Pro Tools, mm-hmm. so I'll pull up an instantiation of machine. And then pull that VST up plugin up within machine. And now I have that VST plugin in Pro Tools. That's pretty good, man. That's a hip little hack. So right there. there's always ways around, you know. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, now so let's let's get into some more questions about recording sessions, about mixing and stuff like that. What can you tell our listeners who I like to refer to as the rock stars? What can you tell the rock stars about running a great recording session when you're working with other musicians? And you're really trying to capture the moment. Well, I think one of the biggest tips is your attitude. I think that our ability is what gets us the work, but it's our attitude that keeps the work coming. You know, yeah. the, the fact that you're you're not the best at, at X, Y, or Z doesn't mean you won't get the job. You can be good at it and still get the job. But to keep the job, it's all about your attitude, your persona, how you treat people. And how you respect people, you know, and that's what makes a great hang. And that's what makes the guys leave the session and go tell their friends, oh, man, I did this killer session with so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. And and we had a blast. And when you start talking like that, they're like, well, I want to be a part of that session. So then when somebody says, oh, do you know anybody that does da-da-da-da-da-da-da? They're like, yeah, man, I hear that he had a great session with, you know. Yeah, I always like to say that a lot of the networking effect of making records is just being on somebody's mind when they think of that and they're like, oh, I got to put a band together for this record next week. Who should it be? And then they remember that they just talked to you or heard about so-and-so. So great attitude is great advice. And sometimes I also find that we know it, but I find myself sometimes second guessing whether, you know, in my head, maybe I think I'm having a great attitude, but maybe my face is reading something else to other people. Do you ever, do you ever go through that where you are not so sure you're delivering the attitude that you intend to deliver on a session. Oh, especially, I mean, especially when, uh, if, uh, you know, if something, if a software is acting up and wants to crash and I've got to restart and, you know, I've got to break for five minutes because of a computer issue or something, you know, I'll, you know, you have to really, you know, kind of try and say, okay, regroup, you know, how's my attitude? Yeah. Like I'm focused on gear and plugging stuff in. So I have to remind people something like, by the way, don't read, if my expression looks like there's something wrong, there's not something wrong. It's just me solving this thing over here, you know, whatever. Yeah. I try and, uh, you know, when I have a, a tracking session, I try and have all of my patching, everything done, mics checked before anybody gets here. Cause, okay. So let's go to this. What happens when everybody gets here? Cause everybody gets here and they hang and they start setting up 
And, you and know, they want to, they want to, they want you to listen to their stories. You, they all want to, you all want to chat and catch up. And, and the reality of it is, is everybody shows up at once, but reality is for the first 45 minutes, you don't need anybody there, but the drummer, you know, cause it's going to take him a while to set up, take him a while to get tuned up. Then you've got to get tones on all of his drums. And then you've got guitar and bass player and artists all just kind of behind you talking, chatting it up, you know, chatting with you. And so it, it gets to be a little hectic. So it's sometimes it's better to just, Hey, let's have the drummer come at, at three and uh, let's get the band to come in at four. Right. right. That way you can kind of get him set up, get him situated, get his tones. And then everybody else is, you know, plug in a mic or two. You're on rock and roll time. I like it. Mine, mine would probably be like, yes, have the drummer come at 10 and the rest of the band can come at 11 AM, you know, (laughs) hopefully I've set up the night before and, you know, all I have to do is sound check when they get there. But I agree with you. There's a lot of power in preparation, being ready for it so that in that first hour of the session, you can get everything up and running. My recent goal has been to, you know, have downbeat within an hour. And even that, even that is slow for some places like how demo houses like uh, County Q, where it's like sound check would be 15 minutes and then they're downbeat. Right. You know? But I mean, of course, everything's already set up too. You know, you, you, it's the only way to do that. Stuff. Right. So, well, and you know, uh, one of my mentors, uh, once told me a guy named Richard Dodd, who's an incredible mix engineer, mastering engineer, you know. Richard's been, uh, he's been making a cameo appearance on the podcast a number of times this week. Uh, Well, (laughs) that's because he's awesome. But yeah, he's been a mentor of mine for a number of years. But one thing he told me that that I think I, I live by now, you know, don't overthink it. It's like, you know, if if at the last minute somebody says, you know, oh, okay, can we cut a vocal on this? And you weren't prepared to cut a vocal and you're, you don't, don't stress over, oh God, I need this mic and I need this pre and I can't use this pre because I got the overheads running through it. You know, the, the best thing that he ever told me was, you know, I'm like, well, what do you use in that situation? He said, whatever's plugged in and ready to go. Yeah, exactly. It's great. You advice. know? If you've got a mic and it's plugged up and ready, you know, use it. Don't lose that moment of creativity for some technical, you know, you know, you don't want it buzzing. You don't want it popping and clicking. But if you can get it down and capture that attitude, that moment, that essence of creativeness that's going on, that's what's going to translate and come across, you know, and be the most important thing. Yeah. I mean, a couple of examples that come to mind for me. One is that you've just finished doing tracking and the drummer's sitting there and they might say, hey, let's put some percussion on that. And it's like, you could go, you could think about, oh, should I set up my favorite percussion mic for standing up over there? And it's like, no, just use the overheads on the drums and let them just shake away. That's it. Duplicate the overheads and go on. Yeah. And then another, uh, this one's a little trickier sometimes, but you might have a, a vocal mic set up out there and then somebody wants to do some hand claps or something and Sometimes you can get away with just using the vocal chain for those, those you know, in the moment overdubs. Sometimes it's compressed too much. <laughs> Last when you reach back, flip bypass. There you go. There you go. <laughs> flip bypass. All right. So um, tell us, this is, I've got this question here. It says, what is mixing all about? I don't even know what that question means, oh, but gosh, fire away. What is mixing all about? Man, I think that mixing is about capturing somebody's vision and helping to make it the best it can be, you know, to sound the best it can be, to feel the best it can be. You know, I don't think it's to take your vision and impose it upon, you know, because you're not the artist, you know, there is an artist and, you know, we're in a service industry, you know, I'm here to serve this artist and to help them be a success, succeed, whatever it is in life. And, so my goal should be to take whoever they are, whoever it is they're they're trying to share to the world and just make it as, you know, not fuck it up. What about in the world of remixing? Do you do remixes or have you have you spent much time in that genre? I've done a handful of remixes, but not a ton. In and I would say that probably leaves way to more you being who you are. You know, that kind of, you become the artist right? in, in exactly. a sense. And you got to trust your own vision. And uh, exactly. Um, and, and I don't, and I don't say that you don't take an artist and not put some of 
yourself and in, into that project because you know you have people that come to you to mix or because of what you do because there's a certain little you know thing you have that you do you know a shtick it could be you know i do a lot of uh a lot of stops and you know reverse swells whatever you know nice or the beat drops or whatever you know that people kind of know me for you know and and my low end, I'm the guy that has a They're lot, like, we lot need of a low Waddell end. On that, we need we need a little you know Waddell and, moment right there. And so and so yeah, so I'll put insert some of those little things, you know. And I even have some of my buddies that you know know my mixes so well now that they'll be they'll like, oh Waddell, you must have mixed such and such such, you know, because <laughs> I heard you know whatever it was that it, you know was one of my things, I guess. Um, well, let's come back to some of those. Maybe I can get you to like hip us to some of your cool cool tricks. But let's talk about the stereo bus for a sec. What are some great mixing tricks for making your stereo bus sound fantastic when you're mixing? And I mean, if you want to, we can stay inside the computer and Pro Tools because a lot of our listeners are, are you know, mixing in the box and using plugins for all this stuff. All I do with my stereo bus is just try and make it loud for the artist to walk away with something that they're not cranking their radio up to a uh, you know, and saying, oh, it's not as loud as this or that, you know, but ultimately all that stuff gets turned off when I send it to somebody like Richard to master, you know? Yeah. So my stereo bus is strictly, you know, I'll put some light compression, a limiter, and just squash it till it's, you know, distorting or not, you know, depending Using on- the limiter, the limiter, just just pull that threshold knob down until it's louder. Actually, I don't, you know, I actually pull the, uh, pull up the makeup gain on the, on the compressor and just let it hit the limiter, which is essentially doing the same thing, but maybe, but maybe <laughs> you never know till you try. But that's both, what right? I'll do is I'll bring my, my, my limiter, you know, my threshold and, and stuff just down the slightest amount. And then rather than hit it, I just send more makeup gain from the compressor into that limiter until I can get it, you know, turn it till I can get it as loud as, you know, they can stand it and you know, they want to hear it, you know, till I, I'm annoyed with it. Right, right. Because and, I mean, and let's then face do you sometimes it, make some changes at that point too, where you're like you rebalance no, a little bit. No, uh, I wouldn't make changes after after all of that. I mean, I feel like you know, because I have no clue what Richard's going to do other than right. make it better. So then, I know he so will. your your compressor across the stereo bus might be that plug in that you're mixing through, and then when you go to print it, you would print it really loud, but you would also print one, or once it's approved, you would print it. You just turn off those. The, the stereo compression in the limiter and just absolutely. kind of print it clean through. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'd strictly do that just so that the client can leave with a, a loud MP3 to listen to because I always, it never fails, you know, man, uh, I, I hear what we did today and I know it's not mixed, but it's still not as loud as Beyonce's record, you know, <laughs> and <I'm, laughs> I keep having to turn it up and I'm like, I mean, is that a problem? You know, just turn it up, you know? So, but for whatever reason, we don't want to turn it up. So, you know, we beat it to death. Yeah. Well, it's it's a good way to handle it and because you're not actually destroying your record. You're just making sure that they, that you get a thumbs up from your client. How do you know when it's too loud? Is it ever too loud? <laughs> I've had some stuff recently where I've been doing a lot of listening. I'll probably get hate mail for this, but I listened through the Bluetooth of my iPhone hitting my car stereo. And then I've had records where it was kind of crackling a little bit. And I, I just asked my mastering guy to turn it down. I was like, well, I'm just going to assume that everybody else is listening on Bluetooth to the car stereo. So I want my record to be loud, but not so, but, but quiet enough that it's not distorting the phone on the way to the car stereo. So that it just sounds clean. Yeah. I don't, I mean, I guess, you know, it's, it's not a horrible thing for it to have a little bit of that distortion on it sometimes, but I don't personally care for it as much, but Recently, I've had uh, one client in particular that has just continued to have me make it louder, make it louder. And I hear all that crackling. And that's when they say, yeah, that's how I like it nice. right there. That's where that's I want how it. I like it. You know, so so it's like, you know, it's definitely pushing the envelope as far as like if I was to ever use that mix as an example of what I do and show someone I would print my own version where it's not hitting quite that hard. Give them two versions. Give them your version and a, or you might like this version. Right. But, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, you know, I think it really depends on the style of music too, you know. Am I trying to capture an old 
60s, 70s Motown vibe, or am I trying to do a Katy Perry record, you right. know, or a, or a more, you know more up to date record? I mean, I think those, I think that the loudness thing has its place, you know, and in, in a within genres, you know. All right, well, great, man. Good, good answer to that. I, I think that's really helpful. Now, how about sharing with us a secret for mixing great drum sounds? You know, a little thing or two about making drums sound great. Man, a secret for mixing well, let's, drums. Let's go straight to your whole, what's what's with the 57s, dude? What's with the 57 drum recording? Man, Tell us about I, that. I like 57s, you know, they just work. Some of the stuff I do, I mean, I think there's a little bit of a grit edge thing to a 57, plus the fact that they're dynamic mics, you know, they're a little more directional. So I can kind of kind of move those guys around on overheads and get a nice... I mean, I don't really use, I guess I do overhead. I don't do overheads and rooms. I usually have one pair of something that's more of a room than it is just an overhead symbol. And I, I dig 57s, you know. I think, you know, a lot of times I'll record with nothing but 57s and, and maybe a D112 on the kick. Mm -hmm. So you got Although I guess I do some, I, I do put up a mono room. I've, got, I've actually got a uh, an original old U47 the original tube in it. Yeah, it's, I saw that on the website. That's so cool. I, I do use that guy sometimes as a mono room, which does make a difference. But what was it you? I think you described it as a, a U forty seven with an increasingly rare original tube in it. Or something. Man, it is so increasingly rare. <laughs> um, I, I, I debate with myself every day: Do I sell this mic before the tube goes out, or do you just sell the tube? And uh, yeah, because it's you know, I don't know what they're going for now. You know, last time I checked, it, I think they were close to four grand. For oh, the tube, if you can find the tube? it. Just wow. for the tube, if you can find wow. it. I fight with that battle every day. Do I sell this mic today or do I hold on to it and hope the tube doesn't go? Keep making records. Keep <laughs> making records. Well, that's very cool. So now describe the space, the size of the room and space for drums that where this kind of miking with the 57 seems to work real well. Does that matter so much? Would it be at work equally in a giant space as a smaller space? You know, I wouldn't know because I never cut drums in a giant space. Okay. Um, not because I wouldn't, uh, just because most of the stuff I do is at, at my place. And, you know, my drum room is the size it is. And, you know, it's not a, a you know, an ocean way or, you mm -hmm. know, some big room. Uh, it's just the room I have, you know. So I have to make adjustments within that room, whether it be, you know, add some carpets and add some baffles to, to deaden it a little bit or take a few out to make it sound a little more live and a little bigger. When I started out, I was going to other studios more and, and recording at other places. But but in recent years, you know, most of what I do is, is mostly in-house. Yeah. Um, did you notice that transition when you started spending a lot of time in your own studio that there was this ability to explore instead of getting a whole bunch of new gear and always trying new stuff, you could just explore the new variations of the stuff you've already got and how powerful that is. Oh my God. You can explore where you put your drum kit in the room. You know, <clears throat> when you go to a, a, a large facility and you're paying two or three grand a day, you know, you can't just move the drums eight times into every spot of the room and really find the sweet spot. But when you're, you know, you have your own space you have to find the sweet spot because, you know, you don't have as many of them. Yeah. So you have to move them around. You have to take the time to, and you've, and that's what you have is you have time and ability to, to move the drums around or move the you know, vocal mic around, try it in this room, try it in that room, move it, you know, until you find the sweet spot. So, you know, I think that over time, you know, your tones get better because obviously you're, you know, you get this one thing and you, you know, you learn it. Yeah. And the size and shape of your drum room is probably uh, somewhat sim similar to somebody else with a home studio. It's like a, we're in, it's in a, the studio's in a, the shape and space of a house, right? Uh, yeah. The drum room. I mean, I guess the only difference is I actually, I have uh, fairly high ceilings in there. I mm -hmm. think they're about 12 feet. Okay. All right. Cool. But other than that, it would be a living room for somebody yeah, essentially. And I've just, uh, like I said, I've got carpets and I've got baffles and things that I've placed in the ceiling, you know, over the years to to get the sound that, you know, that I need out of the room. What are some other drum treatment things you might do? You cut drums in there when you're mixing, for example. Man, some when I'm mixing, uh, a tip would be I use machine to replace my kick and snare. Okay, cool. Um, and I wouldn't say that I replace my kick and snare because I, I don't normally replace them. I normally add to the original kick and snare that I have 
to give it the things that that I may be missing. You know, if I need more booty, if I need more chest, if I need more snap, you know, I'll pull up samples. Or if it just needs to sound a little more program pop and it's a live drummer, you know, just to give it a little more of that program sound to add to what I've cut. Unless, of course, I have way too much ring in my snare. I don't do a lot of rock music that would have that sort of thing. So, so I try to make sure that, you know, my snare doesn't have a lot of ring in it. Make sure my toms don't, you know, ring too much when I'm hitting the snare Yeah. so that I can, you know, really use my room mics. What are some treatments for the drums that help prevent those rings when you're recording them? Old t-shirts and duct tape, you know, um, we'll do that. And then sometimes just bleed of, of the cymbals when you really want to use your room sounds for rooms, but the cymbals are so loud. You know, I'll tell the drummer, hey, uh, let's do this take and don't play any crashes. And then we'll go back and do a second pass, you know, drum set up the same way and add crashes, you know, so that I can really use those rooms for, you know, and yeah. not have to fight with that, you know, pulling up a DSer to bring down the cymbals and the room mics right, or, or right, something right. like that, you know. When you uh, overdub those crashes and you mix it, it sounds like they were hit in real time with the drums. Because they were hit in the same room with the same mics, with the same setup, the same day, you yeah. know. Yeah. All right, cool. Now, what about triggering in machine? Does machine actually have a trigger feature for audio or do you use another tool to trigger with? No, I use a program called DTM by Massey. Or I use a program called Melodyne by Celimony. Either one of those two, I'll use at any given time to convert my audio tracks into actual MIDI notes. Okay, cool. Bringing it back to MIDI. Bring it back to MIDI. (laughs) And then once I bring them back to MIDI notes, that's when I'll normally, I would say nine times out of 10, I'll pull them in machine. Uh, If I don't pull them in machine, I'll pull them into battery, which is yet another Native Instruments plug-in. just depends on the style of music, what I'm doing. You know, a lot of times when I pull them in the machine, it's because I'm doing so much other programming on the track, you know, within machine as well, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, I've used an older version of battery. I haven't got the newest one, but I'm, I'm pretty, I'm going to get it. I love that stuff. It's very cool. It's very cool. Well, very cool, man. So I'm about to take a break and then we'll come in for the, the jam session here at the end. But before we do, let me ask you for one more tip about mixing great vocals give us give us a good vocal mixing trick a great vocal mixing trick um what are some are there or even if it's not a great vocal mixing trick is there just like a standard array of things that you'll bring up when you're mixing that you want to have available for mixing vocals tons of eqs and compressors (laughs) i i think i'm definitely one that's not scared of compressors and compression i use them a lot especially on vocals I don't normally track with them a lot on like drums and stuff. I usually keep that fairly right. But, and especially with today's pop music and, and music and today's music in general is, you know, they're pretty squashed. Probably the, the one tip I would say about compression with, with guys is to make sure you don't over compress, but yet you can over compress. You know, if I tell somebody, man, I hit that vocal 12 dB on, on this compressor and then went straight into another one and hit it another 10, you know, they're like, how can you do that? I think the key is using fast release times. Okay. So it doesn't sound like it's compressing. Right, when you, you, when, you, when you make those releases slow, it's obvious. You just squashed the shit out of something. Yeah. But if you use faster release times and it's letting go and it's only catching those those peaks, you know, depending on where you have your attack set, uh, then I think you can get away with more compression, you know? Well, so some of the things that happen to me regularly when I'm compressing stuff a lot is I I will find that the S's can get out of hand and I'll find that sometimes the mid range gets out of hand for me. And also you get that sometimes the attack of sounds just like punch punches through your mix. Do you have any advice for how to handle those those issues? Are those things that you run into or is it just me? It could just be me. No, I think those are things we run into. I use de-essers, you know, number one, and I'll use maybe two or three if I have to. You okay, know, quick, quick question. Where does the de-esser go in your vocal mixing chain? At the early, before compression, or at the end after compression? Do you know? Uh, it varies. I usually experiment with it. You know, I try and start pulling up my plugins, 
you know, where I've got room on top and bottom. And then I kind of rearrange them as, as I work to say, okay, is this working better here? Is this feel better over here? You know, but I'll use, you know, multiple de-essers. I'll do, uh, I do a lot of parallel stuff. So I'll have a vocal track that, uh, is maybe squashed, but then maybe I kill all the S's, you know, kill all the breaths. And there's nothing in that track, but the good stuff, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's super, you know, then I can super compress him versus not touching the, the original and just bring him in lightly up under. Um, but I think it's also the singer, you know, singers can sing with more S's or they can sing with less S's. Yeah. Less you know? S's. Less, less S's. Less, less S's. Um, so and the same with P's, you know, you can sing with a softer P and, and so sometimes it just yeah. requires a little more work and sometimes, you know. So I was going to inject it. a little shout out from both of us to Avid, if they're listening into this podcast, how about shuffle mode for plugins? Oh, so when you're rearranging. I've already thought about that. Yeah. yeah you just I, drag one over and I think, it just pops yeah, the other ones. Personas the does that. That's a really cool, cool one that they do. I would love to see Avid do that, but, um. But they're doing some great things, you know, and, and I'm yeah. excited about where they're going and where they're headed. And, and uh, I'm not leaving. You know, I've been with them since, I don't know, an Audio Media 3 card or Session 8 maybe, you know. I've been with them that long using their products. And back in 2000, I was on the road with them for a year or two. I, I think they're great guys. I think it's a great company. And, yeah. and, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a big fan hard. of Tools. I've been using it since about 92 myself, so. So, all right, well, let's see. I wanted to ask you this question. So some of the things that happen when you're really treating vocals, sometimes it seems to me like the answer is in intentionally going in and editing the audio track. So like maybe you just need to clip gain down all the S's. And I've also found that sometimes I can get the S's to sit right in my de but the other things like th, sh, like the SH's, I need a different de to try and get that frequency. And that's the thing, you know, what's, what's stopping you from pulling up two de and changing your, your frequency, you know, where you're doing it or using a dynamic EQ. Dynamic EQs are great for that, you know? Tell, describe dynamic EQs for us a little more. I mean, essentially it's, it's an EQ that when a certain unwanted frequency peeks its head out, it just kind of dips it dips it down, dips it up where, you know, whatever you set it on, but it can dip down just for that moment. That way, if, if it is a th or some kind of a low end thing where if you EQ that out, the whole track sounds thin, mm -hmm. you know, this is only going to get it when it hears that th, it's going to bring that down for that moment. But then yet the rest of your track will, you know, still be nice and meaty. Yeah. Um, do you have any favorite uh, or any plugins that we should, that are good dynamic EQs we want to go look for? Check um, out at least. I mean, yeah, I have favorite plugins. I think BX, BX makes one, right? Yeah, Brainworks. Yeah. Yeah, they make a really good one. I don't own it. I would love to own it. Is but, there a uh, DSP as well? But it is a is a great one. Uh, I'm not sure if DSP has one. It's all right. I can't remember the names of my plugins either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, I just know it's there. I know what it looks like when I use it. Yeah, I use a ton of UAD stuff. Um, love their stuff. Like you mentioned, the DSP, Colin, those guys are great. Metric Halo, I think that's a company that's probably not spoken about enough. You know, I think that may have been one of the first plugins I ever bought to my Pro Tool system. Channel Strip? Way back. Channel Strip. Yeah, that was a big, and, um, big winner. And they had a, another program called SpectraFoo that was an analyzer. I got yeah. both of those. Those guys are incredible. And that plugin is like a staple to me. Like, it's almost, I would say it's probably somewhere on every track maybe even once or tw maybe even twice, you know, just luring its head somewhere in case I need to, to compress something real quick, like, or EQ something. I just feel like it does a really clean job without doing too much coloration. Yeah. And, uh, and just, it's gooey, you know, how it works, how I interact with it is quick and efficient. And I think that's important nowadays, you know, it's, it's not about who has the best DAW. It's about who has the one, that I can be the most efficient on. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, that's why I'm a Pro Tools guy versus a, you know, diehard Logic guy or whatever. You know, even though, I, like I said, those, those programs are great. My thing is that I can move quicker on Pro Tools than I can any of the others. And I think what sets them apart for me is that there's a key command for everything. 
And they really focused on teaching those key commands, that being a part of every. So, so I can use one hand to hit, you know, to zoom, to zoom in, zoom out, zoom up, zoom down, you know, all. And, and some of the other programs, they're, I feel like they're very mouse oriented. And I feel like I've got to move here to do this and move here. And I think that that slows me down versus I can hit four keys much quicker than I can drag the mouse I, you know, I over equated, to a location. I was equated also as well to like when we were kids and you'd learn a video game and you learn how to use the controller on it so you didn't have to think about it. And then you go over to your friend's house and he's got a different video game. He's like, come on, play this game Dude. with me. And you pick it up and you're like, I, I, I can't do anything on this. PlayStation and Xbox. Perfect examples, yeah. you know? So... You know, and some of the guys have been really good to, uh, like the Studio One guys have been really good to create, you know, sets that the key commands kind of match up, you know, which is is helpful and speeds up the process. Uh, but ultimately, I've just been been with Avid so long that I know, you know, I don't think about those key commands. My hand just moves around the keyboard now. One of the things I do like about Presonus and Studio One is that those guys are moving quickly. They're like, they're, they're definitely they're moving quickly. Evolving that. And that it's a very really creative quickly. tool. I mean, it's, 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 you know, I played with it a little bit and it's just been really fun and exciting to kind of play with it and see where it's going and see if it's something that I could, you know, I, I don't think I will, there will ever be anything to replace Avid Pro Tools for me, but I can definitely, you know, just like I use Machina. Mm-hmm. You know, in Pro Tools in some way, I can see myself using Studio One and incorporating that in my setup. Um, just like live, you know, incorporating some of those features into what I do because, you know, they all don't have the same features and there are some features that you want to do what, you know. We need some, uh, I don't know of an AAX plugin that will just inject an entire DAW into your Pro Tools session, but that'd be kind of fun. Oh, I know, right? I think we used to kind of do that with Rewire. Um, well, cool, man. Well, let's take a break here and we'll come back in just a sec for the jam session. And Rockstar is a reminder to you that I'll include links to all the stuff that we're talking about here with our guest, James Waddell, in the show notes at rsrockstars.com. And then just search for James Waddell, W-A-D-D-E-L-L, and it'll take you right to the blog post. And if you're on the iPhone, you can just click through and uh, and click on the logo and it'll just bring up the show notes. You could click through and go straight to go check things out. And then if you haven't done it already, come join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash recording studio rock stars. And then just uh, ask to be invited and I'll click you right in and come say hello and interact with everybody, all the other rock stars there and, uh, and uh, throw your questions in and help other people with theirs. Cheers. We'll see you guys in a minute for the jam session. Hey everybody, it's Lid Shaw, and I want to thank you so much for listening to this episode of Recording Studio Rockstars. I really appreciate you, and I really appreciate your time. And as a way of saying thank you, I've created a special mix tutorial just for you, Rockstars, totally free, called the Mix Master Bundle. With it, you get over two hours of detailed videos watching over my shoulder as I mix a song in my studio. Plus, I give you the free ebook that explains how I recorded the tracks, and you get downloadable multi tracks so that you can practice your mixes, including the Pro Tools session file, using nothing but stock plugins in Pro Tools, all of which you would find in any other DAW, whether you're on Logic or Studio One or Reaper. Maybe you're struggling with trying to improve your mix technique, or maybe you just simply don't have access to multi track files or can't record a full drum set in your studio. I wanted to give you a chance to create your own mixes from full drum kit, bass, and guitars recorded in my studio. The song is called American Winter, and it's off my instrumental record, Skadoosh, and it's all available for you totally free right now. All you need to do to get it is text Mix Master Bundle to 33444, and I'll send it directly to your email. Again, that's Mix Master Bundle with no space to 33444. 444, or you can go directly to mixmasterbundle.com, enter your email, and I'll send all the files directly to you. Thanks so much, rock stars. We'll see you guys in the jam session. Cheers. Hey, rock stars, welcome back. And we're here for the jam session with our guest today, James Waddell at Lyric Canvas Studio. 
in Nashville, Tennessee. James, are you ready to jam, my man? I'm ready. Awesome, dude. Well, so when you started out in recording, what was one of the things that was really holding you back? Oh, man. The one thing that was holding me back, and I still think it it sometimes holds me back, is is not thinking I was ever good enough, you know, is, is, uh, well, or maybe not, not being good enough. I mean, you're so exposed as an artist, you know, that you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to play this for somebody. What if they don't like it? Yeah. You know? And I think that anybody that, whatever they do, you know, we're engineers mostly. So, so, you know, in our world, what if somebody doesn't like what I do? It's okay. You have to get to a place to where you feel like, you know, not everybody's going to like, you know, everybody doesn't like vanilla ice cream. Some people like chocolate. Some people like cookies and cream, you know? So you just have to be, get to a place to where you're confident in what you do. You know, and what's tricky is as the engineer, you probably like vanilla and chocolate and cookies and cream. And the problem is you play your vanilla track for the chocolate ice cream. And then later you play your chocolate ice cream track for the vanilla and they, they look at you like you're crazy, you know? And, and you were so proud of what you were playing too. It always happens. And, and especially when, you know, you get people in and when you work in, in many genres of music, you know, because I do a ton of gospel music. I do a lot of pop music. Then I do a lot of soul music. And then I do a hip hop music. You know, you get somebody that comes in and says, hey, let me hear your stuff. And you're like, well, what are you looking for? You know, so I can put Taylor some examples for what you're looking for, because I do a handful of things, you know. Do you have a process? Do you sort of like grab some links and throw it in an email to somebody? Or have you decided you've got different web pages on your site where one's country oriented, one's gospel oriented, something like that? Do you still have to go like, oh man, what am I going to play them every time? I think, yeah, I think I have to go, what am I, what am I going to play them every time? Or what am I going to send them? Um, but, but normally, I mean, it's usually whatever some of the latest stuff that I'm working on, because that's usually the stuff, you know, that I'm excited about because I'm working on something, you know, and, and there are a few things that I've done, you know, that I'm like really proud of. And I'm like, you know, I'll, I'll pull those out occasionally, but, but whatever I'm working on it at a current time, you know, is, is usually what I'll pull up, you know? Nice. Well, all right. Now, how about some of the best advice you remember receiving? I worked with a producer, uh, Sanchez Harley, who's an amazing, amazing producer. And he, he once told me, he said, uh, he said, James, he said, if you don't have a heartbeat, you're dying. And if you're not breathing, you're dying. He said, and it's the same way with a track. Every track needs a heartbeat and every track needs to breathe. Now, whether that's muting tracks when you get them as a mix engineer, you're like, well, we don't need this, 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 and you mute a bunch of things to create space or whether you're carving out space with EQs, you know, it has to have space to be able to breathe and it has to have a pulse to live. I like that. So the heartbeat is, you know, is that pulse of the tune. It's maybe what makes you tap your foot or just keeps you feeling like you're in the. Makes you want to bob your head. Yeah. Makes you want to look like a bobblehead. Make the yes expression, bounce your head. And then the, uh, the breathing is the, is the space in between the notes. It's the dynamic or it's the arrangement of the song. Yeah. And a lot of times, especially with, with the technology that we have now, you know, back, Back in the day when we were on tape machines, we only had 24 tracks unless we had the money to link two machines up and buy another reel of tape, you know? And and now we're kind of unlimited with those things. So people will throw the kitchen sink in. You know, you might get a track that has, you know, six kick drums and four snares and, you know, 20 synth parts and, you know, and, and you don't, you know, and it may have been cool at the time, but you don't necessarily need all of that at the end of the day. So you pick the things that are important and that you need to create and create that space and that openness. And then when the client comes in, if they're like, Hey, I really want that synth track, you know, that was doing da, 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 da. Then you bring that in and you try and fit it into the mix, pull something else out, maybe carve out a space for it, you know, but you don't necessarily get all these tracks and they don't, ne- they don't have to be there just because they were recorded. Yeah. I think I've heard a hilarious story. I forgot who told it. It may have been on the podcast and apologize, but the, um, it was somebody receiving like six kicks and two of them were the same. (laughs) Yes. The same track twice, you know, it just gets it louder. It does. So uh, now how about a great recording tip, hack or secret sauce, something our listeners can use right now on the, the next session they do. Again, back to native instruments, they don't, you know, not only do they have Machina, but they have this complete package that has synths and samplers 
And actually, their effects are really cool. I've been I've been using those a lot in my mixes now. And um, they've got this de- delay called Replica that not only does a delay, it does a handful of things. But but I was playing with some some stuff on it and ended up with this really almost ethereal synth you know, kind of a thing that it was doing to the vocal. And I was like, that's cool, but it's not delayed, you know, and I wanted a delay. I said, but this is a really cool sound. So what if I put a delay on this sound? So I basically, you know, dropped a delay on a delay so that I could move, you know, an effect. Yeah. Rather than, okay, I don't want to necessarily delay the line to be a repeat, but this effect that this, this created, I want to make it delayed, you know? Mm. So that was kind of a cool little thing. And that's kind of been one of my, you know, neat little signatures, I guess you would say that, that I've done on the last couple of tracks, you know, here and there um, where it fits. I like the idea that sometimes you get unexpected results with your plugins and don't just, don't get frustrated because that first one wasn't just delaying later in time. Just do something simple, like throw another delay in front of it. Well, I see songs as as colors, as paintings, you know, and I see gear as paintings. So, so every piece of gear I have, maybe you know, if it, if I have three compressors, that to me they're just three different shades of red, you know, right, right. and three cues are just different shades of blue, and uh, and so I try to paint that picture and put things in the foreground, put things in the background when I'm mixing, and I never start with the same paint I used from the last portrait. You know, that paint is old, that paint is dry. I always get fresh paint. I always start from scratch. And and then I think there's a place for templates and things like that, you know, that'll help you kind of move along quicker. But I don't approach, I never approach a second song the same way I approached the previous one, even if it's the same record, you know. I'll keep I'll keep something similar, but but I think that helps me stay creative and makes it more exciting for me. You know, it becomes more like a, an assembly line if I just pull in the same EQ or this, I mean, the same reverb that I used, you know, because every song is going to be a little different. It's going to have a few different tracks and those things are going to hold a different space. And so, you know, your kick drum is going to have to be a little different, even though it was recorded the same day, you know, across three songs because of the other things going on in the track. Right. And if you pull in a template, you probably have to go adjust that template to get the kick right. Always, so, I think and my, maybe that takes the same amount of time as just starting over with the kick. Right, my my templates would consist of you know, for example, I, I may have an aux track and, that I call delay, and as far as the plugins go, I may have four delays on it that I just have inactive. So my template is bringing in that delay, but then my creative is like, okay, now which one of those do I turn on and actually use to do this delay? Yeah, yeah. Versus, I always go to X for my you know. Well, that's a cool tip. And I know that sometimes, you know, your computer may struggle with how many plugins you can have. I don't know if it struggles if they're inactive. It doesn't struggle if they're inactive. So that's where you can pull in, you know, you can pull up, you know, a reverb and have four different reverbs. And as long as they're inactive, you know, you're good. And then you can decide at that moment, you know, well, well, let me turn this one on. Okay, let me turn it off. Let me turn on this other one. You know? Now, inactive, different from bypass. Way different right. than bypass. Can yes. You, can you hip us to exactly what we're talking about in Pro Tools? So bypass is just bypassing the plug where you're not hearing the plug. Um, inactive would essentially be turning off the plug without actually uninstantiating it or taking it off of the track. So it's still it's there. You can it's see still it there, and, the and it's kind of grayed stuff. out. And what's our, what's our way of doing that? Do we click on the the window, or do we have to key click it? It's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you can right click it on, in Pro Tools and select inactivate, that or you like can, uh, way, yeah. yeah, I think Command Control click it will also inactivate. Okay, it. cool, great tip. That's awesome, man. Very cool. Let's go to favorite hardware tool. Something that when you physically, when you have this physical object with you in the studio on sessions, you're always glad you got it. it seems to make your sessions go better. Can be anything you anything you want. My favorite right now, I guess, you know, your favorites change over the year, but my, my current favorite would be, I, I have an old Neve 1073 Pre. I would say that's probably my current favorite hardware piece. Why, do those things sound good? Man, <laughs> yes, it does. It sounds real, real good. So that, that's probably my current favorite hardware piece that I use. Nice. Well, okay, here's something a little left of center. We were talking about trackballs outside. Oh, yes. 
how important is it for you to have a trackball when you're working? And what is a trackball? Maybe not everybody even, it's kind of old school now, you know, the old four button turbo mouse. Yeah, right? which is what I have. You know, the trackball is a mouse type device that has multiple buttons on it that, that you can actually program to, to do various, you know, operations or actually multiple operations, you know. I'll create different little sets at times uh, if I'm editing or something. Sometimes you want to zoom in to, a, to an area, really zoom in, and then select an area and then delete it and then zoom back out so that you can move over to the next section. So sometimes I'll create one to where, say, I'm zoomed in and I make my selection and I hit one button and it'll automatically cut, zoom out, and tab to the next region, you know, all in one full motion. I think the, it works great when you do things like that. But then as you do things like that, and if you ever go somewhere else to work and you don't have your trackball, then you're like, what is this supposed to do? <laughs> yeah, I think we were talking about uh, extended keyboards versus the keyboards now that don't have the numeric keypad on the right. You know, that I think that's probably my biggest crutch is that I'm always using three to record, seven. We talked about turning the metronome on and off, all those little single button Mm-hmm. you know, things. Mm-hmm. And then when that's gone, then I have to think, okay, where do I go to show my session setup window? You know, it's not, yeah. it's not command five because I don't have that five. All right. So rock stars, get yourself a Kensington turbo mouse, <laughs> which has got the, it's a big trackball. It's not a little, little one where no, your hands grabbing one. around the thing. Uh, I don't like those as much, but big trackball and it's got the four buttons on it. You can do cord up top, cord down below, program your buttons, but then also the extended keyboard that James is talking about. And the one I've got now is extended where you've got the keyboard. It's got the number pad on the right. And then it's got like the home end buttons in the middle mm-hmm. um, with the arrows. And those are really key because what I discovered is when my sessions are really big in Pro Tools and I have to get to the top kick. I, I like to put the drums at the top. So kick is usually the first track of my session. And at the very bottom is probably like the master fader or something. And to navigate can use the home buttons and it and it will leap vertically up to the top track and back down to the bottom real quickly so that's nice for getting around quickly yes do you ever use the universe i never you, use the universe I've never I, ever used universe i, I think usually, it's for tv and film yeah i usually turn it in it turn it off you know raise it up uh just to give me a little more screen real estate yeah yeah exactly all right so how about a favorite software tool i feel like we've talked about a lot of those maybe it's the same answer as before but how about a new one is there another software tool that you like to have on sessions when you've been when you've got it around you're like thank god i've got this one oh man now there are a number of those and it and then i would also say it depends on whether i'm tracking or whether i'm mixing as how to about- how about an EQ? You want to name an EQ that, that you tend to use a lot? Again, uh, Metric Halos Channel Strip is, would be kind of a, you know, if I'm not trying to do any coloring or anything, I just need to to do some some cutting out of some, something bad or, or boost a little bit here. You know, that's usually my go-to. And again, it, it's all about how the plugin works, how I can interact. You know, I don't have I don't have to go and click a knob and, and change. The key. I can grab a dot and drag it up, drag it down, hold down a key command, make it narrow, make it wide. So it's it's really more about efficiency. Again, like we talked about earlier, because um, of the state of the industry, you know, where it's been over the last year, where it's headed and where it's gone, is that it's about being efficient for me now, you know, because, yeah. you know, there are a lot of EQs that, that work great. You know, there, now there are some that, a pull tech or something plug in that may definitely do something a little different. You you definitely want those for certain things. But as far as just a go to quick guy, you want something that's going to be efficient and and that you know how to use with the right key commands. Yes. Yeah. Do you use any other controllers to control your plugins? Do you have some like physical MIDI knobs that control any plugins when you're working? Well, I do. I, I, and I program those things or I, you know, I still, I hate to say it, but I still, I don't hate to say it, but I still have a command eight. So do I. And I use that sucker for one or two little things, you know, whether it's just to ride a fader or occasionally to really good to use the tr- that transport. Because if I pull up another front end of a plugin that maybe disables my space bar as the play button, hmm. then I can still use it as the transport, like in Melodyne or something and keep Melodyne in the forefront 
while I'm still transport, you know, playing oh, in Pro Tools. That's smart. That's good. So there's just little things like that. You know, there are a few little little features that I that I just use all the time. And then all my other control, you know, keyboards or machina, even, you know, I can put it in controller mode and at any point just, you know, send something to a knob or send something to a button and 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 automate it, you know, in some way. Very cool. All right. How about a resource for the business side of doing what we do? I mean, you are making records for a living. You have been for a long time. Are there any uh, tools we should know about online or any methods for making sure that you can survive doing this for, for a career or any individuals we need to be introduced to? Uh, man, you know what's changed my life? And, uh, and I don't get paid by these guys either. And I don't subscribe to their service, but I bought, I don't know if you've heard of the, uh, the neat receipt scanner. Uh, no, I haven't a, used that yet. It's just a little scanner and, and they have a subscription service where you can subscribe so you can take pictures with your phone and it scans in all your receipts, all your bills, that sort of thing. And um, and then it's a physical scanner as well that, you know, is plugged up to my laptop. And I think that's changed my life more than anything because I hate the business side. I hate, I like being creative. I, you know, that's what we do. That's what we are. You know, that's what we want to be. But that's what's changed my life. The, the neat scanner, I think, is what it's called. And, you know, when I get bills in or when I get receipts that I've, you know, been stacking in my wallet, I can just pop them in that thing. It scans them all in. Then I don't have to, like, get a big envelope and save them anymore. Mm-hmm. I can throw them all away. And they're, you know, they're right there in one place. It does a pretty good job of like analyzing the receipt and, so it and picks out pop, the name, picks and, out the the name wow. and the date and the amounts. And I mean, you still have to double check it, but I think that's probably the one thing because that's the one thing I hate doing more than anything is Me trying too. to input that information into QuickBooks or something. So now I just, you know, go to a folder and say, this is my utilities folder and scan all my utilities bills in and then select another folder that may be my bank account folder and scan on my bank account, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, and can knock it out fairly quickly with that guy. Yeah, that's great. Great tip, man. I like that. Nobody's shared anything like that yet, so that's great. All right, so here's a hypothetical question. If you had to start all this all over again, you were dropped into a new city to, to uh, make music and do recordings. You had, I don't know, thousand bucks, two thousand bucks, something like that, and you needed a, to have a simple setup for recording. You needed to find people to record, make music with, and then you needed to make ends meet so that you could uh, pay bills and eat and stuff like that. What what would you use for a simple setup? How would you find people? What would you recommend as a first place to look for income? Maybe a Mac Mini. As far as an I.O. goes, I think that both Apogee and UAD, you know, have small devices. Um, I actually have a the Apollo Twin, which I think is a great device. You know, you got two inputs, you've got four outputs if you use the headphone outputs. So that would give you, you know, what you need to start doing some recording. Again, for me, it's Pro Tools as my recording package. If I didn't have the money, I mean, I could go as simple as to download Reaper for free. Pro Tools free. And uh, Pro Tools free, you know. Or Pro Tools first, sorry. That's what it's First called. now, yeah. Pro Tools free is the old school. <laughs> Very um, old school. Uh, and Pro Tools first, I think you're limited to whatever plugins they give. You can't add third-party plugins, but um, yeah, you start you ha- out. You're you can limited only have to the number of tracks. And, at first. Um, but there's, you know, like Reaper is, a, I think it's a free app, and then I would have to have some sort of uh, machine, machina, you know, native instruments are are some tor- sort of a way to, for me to make my beats. Yeah. So I would prefer that little setup, and that way whether I was working for somebody or not, I would have enough to create on my own. As far as what would I do yeah, what's to the make first place? ends meet, I would do whatever it took. Growing up as a boy, I grew up as a as a builder and a carpenter. So so I do have that trade under my belt that you know, I could go to work in construction if I needed to or go into building custom cabinets for people, you know, doing something like that. But whatever it takes to make ends meet. So, you know, when I started out, finished up school here in Nashville, I wasn't making ends meet as a as an engineer as a programmer. I was just getting my feet wet. But I started teaching at a a technical college here, and I did that two days a week for probably the first five or six years. That helped make ends meet while I was working on getting my career off the ground. And you were teaching recording stuff or teaching something else? I actually started teaching uh, intro to MIDI. Nice. And um and and it was not even a 
program. It wasn't even a degree program. It was a program that someone had just started. He had two audio classes, asked me to come teach a MIDI class. And uh, so I taught a MIDI class there. And by the time I finished, I had an intro and advanced MIDI and was teaching intro and advanced digital audio. I think today it's actually a two-year degree program. And, you know. Yeah, probably. So well, that's cool, man. Now, what about finding people to make music and records with? Any tips for? I wouldn't know? have a clue. You know, I guess I would probably go out to shows, go out to clubs, listen to bands. That's where people tend to go and whatever the local scene is, try and find that out. Maybe, you know, if it's coffee shops, if songwriters, you want to do songwriting demos, you know, any places like that, you know? Yeah. Nice. All right, cool. Well now um, here's the big doozy of a question. Tell our listeners, what is the single most important thing that they can do to become a rock star of the recording studio themselves? The single most important thing. Well, again, when you're working with other people, it's all about attitude you know, not just being a nice guy, but being a great hang. You know, there's a, a thing we've always talked about around town, you know, me and a handful of people. It's like, you always, before you agree to do a session, you check out uh, three things, you know, does it, how does the, does it pay well or not pay well? Is the music cool? And are the people you're working with a cool hang, somebody you'd like to hang with? And if the session has two of those three, you do it. <laughs> but if it only has one, you don't do the session, you know? That's awesome, man. I love that. Dropping some some golden quotes on us there. All right, that's pretty much, I, I don't have any more questions for you today. Okay. That, that pretty much sums it up. But thank you so much for joining us on Recording Studio Rockstars. James, how can our listeners find you, follow you, learn more about your work? Well, I'm, I'm on Facebook like everyone else. And it's it, under James Waddell. And then my studio is, is under Lyric Canvas. And it's actually... The word lyric, like a song lyric, and the word canvas, like a painter's canvas. But the C is actually common. So it's one word. It's L-Y-R-I-C-A-N-V-A-S. And then I also have lyriccanvas.com as a website. It desperately needs to be updated. But I think there's still, you know some information there and, and, you know, you can reach my, my email and things are on there. So. Well, hopefully if it's not updated, it's because you're busy making records in the studio. <sighs> yes, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> James, thanks so much for, for joining us again. Rockstars, you can also get the show notes, a reminder at rsrockstars.com. Um, and then just search James Waddell, W-A-D-D-E-L-L. And um, that's pretty much it. We'll see you around the studio, dude. Thanks awesome. so much for being here with us. Thanks for having me, Lex. You rock, man. Cheers. Awesome. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music.